the theme today is, as I'm sure you'll know, the voice of peace. Uh, Johnny Lewis, who's sitting beside me and myself, have spoken with Hans and the directors of Albert Hein, uh, the directors of the show. Uh, we decided to slightly change things. Instead of being a first half dealing with the period from 1960-odd up to 1980, broadly speaking, the first half of The Voice of Peace, and a second part dealing with the second half from 1980 up to the present day, we've decided to amalgamate the whole thing, bearing in mind that some of us here have been here at The Voice of Peace in the 70s and in the 80s. So first of all, I'd like to introduce to the people here, Bill Dancer, one person who the, the Voice of Peace would never work without. A very important man, Don Stevens, who you may have remember seen, having seen in How the West Was Won. Uh, Johnny Lewis no, needs no introduction. <laughs> Thank you. Cass van Eersel. Cass Collins. Cass Collins, yeah. And somebody who I haven't seen for mm, a long, long time, Keith York. Hi. <clears throat> um, Don, may I start with you? Where have you been all these years? <laughs> Loaded question. I've been um, basically being an entrepreneur, just making a living. Um, doing a bit of radio, doing some marketing, um, selling Egyptian artifacts, one of my little businesses, um, just being around. Okay. How, all right, simple question, stupid question, perhaps it's worth asking anyway. How did you first get involved with the VOP and when? It was really through Bill here. We worked together on the Mi Amigo and uh, Bill and I used to spend long hours in the, uh, uh, the mess room on the Mi Amigo talking politics and trying to change the world. And one we day, succeed. we didn't succeed. And Bill one day said to me, you know, you should work for A.B. Nathan on Kola Shalom. So after various problems with the British authorities over the Caroline gig, which involved a court case, um, Keith Ashton contacted me and suggested that uh, my talents were required in Israel. So off I went, and I remember climbing up the ladder, and a certain Bill Dance said, hot for Dommer. <laughs> Don Stevens, what are you doing here? <laughs> and that's how I became involved in the peace ship. I didn't swear, did I? Yes, you did. I didn't realise that. Sorry. You said it. I'm quoting you. Well, and when you first got out of the ship, how did you find things on board? Was it a comfortable ship? Oh, in those days, yes, it was. And when, it when was, were those days? Uh, we're talking March 1976. Uh, the station was absolutely professional. It was so slick. The DJs were Australian and uh, uh, obviously international broadcasters from the UK. But the, the station sound was very reminiscent of the Big L off the coast of Britain in the previous uh, decade in the 60s. Yeah. It was making a lot of money. And uh, that, Nathan, that isn't what I asked, Don. I asked, was it comfortable? It was very comfortable. It was comfortable. We were making all. loads of money. All right. Well, that would... we, were, <laughs> we were living very well. We had everything. It was absolutely the best place to be at that time. All right. And if I may spring ahead a little bit further and ask Cass, you were there in the 80s. Do you want to do that again? Uh, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, people are... People are filling in the numbers. It was 78, 79, right. 80, 81. Did, did you find the ship comfortable to work? No, not at all. It just depended on the tenders, on what happened to be brought over. Usually beans, white bread. <laughs> I've, can, can, I, can I tell the incident with the cook and the bay leaves? Are you tell familiar the story. with that, Bob? Tell the story. We had a cook, a Vietnam veteran. His name was Monty, Monty something. Monty Levinson. Ponytail, beard, hair everywhere. Uh, he would have, he would have ridden a Harley Davidson if, uh, yeah, if we were, if we would have been on shore. <laughs> and he, he got to be the cook somehow. <laughs> and provisions were not that steady. So I remember one time we got this big bag full of bay leaves. Remember that, Johnny? Mm -hmm. And the guy started putting bay leaves, laurier blachius, into absolutely everything. Custard. <laughs> Custard. Yeah, yeah. We, Seriously. Really. And we started to rebel. And then there was this one incident where he actually laced the dessert with bay leaves and it just drove his nuts. And about that time, he was due to go home. So who was the Australian guy, the program director? Oh, Keith, Ashton. Ashton. Keith Ashton. Keith Ashton. Yeah. Oh. Anyway, he came up with a stunt of, of putting bay leaves into aluminum foil, into plastic, wrapping it tightly, and sticking it into Monty's suitcase. <laughs> 
And we later heard that Monty was held up at customs <laughs> at the airport and actually missed his flight. That was so sweet much. revenge. <laughs> oh, dear. <sighs> well, okay, Johnny, your time to tell a funny story. Well, I was, where do you start, really? Well, we're on a chef's story. Tell them about the German guy with the hot pickled cabbage. Oh, go on. Yeah, you remember that. I can't remember. That. There's, there's just so many. With, there was you know, this just so German guy who was a chef, and he used to sunbathe naked on the generator deck. <laughs> and uh, complaints were coming in from Shalom Tower. Oh, yes. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do now, yeah. Shalom Tower is a huge... Yeah. Was that? Those yeah. there, it's right? a huge, great building. In uh, Tel Aviv. Oh, yeah, they spy on everyone from there. Yeah. It was the, yeah. the headquarters of the Mossad, wasn't it? <laughs> it probably was. And this, um, this chef, wasn't it? German chef. I can't remember his name. Michael yeah, I can't or remember his name. But was yeah. And AB comes on the old, we used to have a Motorola, didn't we? Hello, peace, hello, peace. Yeah. Yeah. And it, we couldn't believe what we were, you know, it was a, can you tell Michael to cover up the Shalom Tower are complaining that he's in the nude? <laughs> <laughs> this guy used to, every meal was red pickled cabbage. Yeah. We just had some weird cooks there, wasn't it? It was just either the Baileys, uh, Baileys, that would have been Baileys. nice, Bailiffs or... Um, ba Bailiffs would have been luxury. Like, yeah. you know? <laughs> but uh, it, it, it was, it was, a, it was one of those highly... Un I, jo I joined the station at, uh, you know, a period when it was get going really well, wasn't it? Because you'd yeah. just come out of Ash... Um, no, Haifa, uh, wasn't uh, it? No, it was Haifa after the reconditioning and the, and the insurance, yeah. Yeah, and uh, had got, the we FM... Joined, we're just in stereo, yeah. Yeah, and stereo. I think you were there, Keith, and you were there, Cash, and you nearly... With the ship nearly uh, found it, didn't it? As you yeah. went into it, Haifa, if you want to tell the story there. Well, I can, well, I can tell you a couple Try. of stories there. I went, uh, I went into the voice space in the middle of 1979. Microphones don't scare you. Come on. Microphones scare me to death. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I went to the voice space in the middle of 1979. And uh, I remember I was on shore leave for a while and I came back to the ship on Christmas Eve in 1979. And immediately a bad storm blew up, and this lasted three days. And of course, the anchor broke eventually. We were drifting all over the place, and then the end. We were kind of at the engine started. We were driving into the storm, and uh, then the engine clogged up because the sea, the rough sea, clogged up the fuel filters because it was agitating the fuel too much. And then uh, the generator stopped as well, and everything was no lights on the ship, no engine, no anything, and we were just like left at the mercy of. of of nature, almost beached, drifting around the place. And I remember we woke up on well on the Saturday morning. We were awake the whole time for about three days. We didn't go to sleep at all. Um, on the Saturday morning, when the sun came up and the storm dropped, and we could see these huge rocks out of the back of the ship, and there were rocks off the coast of Herzliya. <laughs> we thought if that storm had lasted another <laughs> couple of hours, we'd have all been dead. And Amy's on this Motorola radio and he's going, save my ship, save my ship, peace, hello, peace, save my ship. There he is in his office in Tel Aviv though, wasn't he? Yeah, I wasn't well, there he at was the sitting time. in his yeah. office like, <laughs> enjoying the action. All right, we've been talking at length <laughs> about eccentric, curious people, but I'd like to... We were saying uh, in Haifa, we drove the ship, myself and Graham Cook actually drove the ship into Haifa. And... Uh, when we went in for the reconditioning, and we were taking, I think, a Force 10, a Force 10 storm on, on the broadside of the ship. I mean, it was hitting us from the side, you know, as it, you had this old Pi radar. You had to keep looking at the Pi radar and, and, and a compass and a big steering wheel. The steering wheel was incredible. It was a huge, big thing. It was bigger than me, which wouldn't take a lot to me. One of the big old wooden ones with the rings spokes, and things, yeah. you know, spokes on it. And... Um, and you had to rope it down because it was direct steering. It was all chains going under the deck, going to the rudder. Direct steering. There's not no electronics or anything there. And uh, if a wave hit the rudder, the wheel would throw you literally, throw you across the bridge. So we had to rope it down. Once we set a course, rope it down. Keep an eye on the radar. Make sure we were steering away from the coast so we didn't get too close to the coast. All this stuff. We eventually, miraculously, made it into Haifa. And at one point, uh, we had the engineer Bill Bennett. You remember Bill? Mm. <laughs> and he was down in the captain's lounge, which was right down the bottom of the stairs from the bridge. And he was telling an old sea dog story about something or other. And, uh, and they all had the Maccabees out and the <laughs> Myself and Graham were trying to, trying to steer this thing. We see this other ship coming across, crossing our bows. And I thought, mate, you meant to kind of pass on the left, uh, like you do on the roads in the UK. You know? And uh, 
that's the law of the sea apparently so we were kind of steering left and this thing kept coming across and coming across and I said we might have a problem here because this thing got very big a huge big ship <laughs> so I went down and I said Bill Hold on a minute, I'll finish my stories. <laughs> <laughs> About ten minutes later, I eventually got his attention. I said, Bill, I think there's a problem. There's a ship coming. And he came up, what the fuck? He said, and he grabbed the wheel and wound it round the other way. <laughs> he literally stood on the thing to wind it round the other way. We went round the way. He said, fucking Turkish ship. <laughs> <It's from Liverpool. laughs> anyway, that's my bit. Off you go. <laughs> right, thanks very much, Keeper. <laughs> We could go on stories like this forever, couldn't oh, we? Oh, yeah, with, yeah. With stories, yeah. Can I just go back to um, Don? Any sort of funny, amusing moments when you were there? Well, you see, when I was in the, on the ship in those days, when Bill and myself were there, it was a far more professional operation. No, just <laughs> respect, <laughs> we were operating... DJs didn't have to steer the ship. <laughs> the DJs yeah. didn't do a thing. You, your, your job was to be on, on the air, and you had to be chain-built 24 hours a day. Pop you music. never chipped paint? No, never did it. We had, we had wow. crew to do that. Oh, yeah. We you also stayed in the Sheraton Hotel in Tel Aviv. You guys never them. did. Some of you guys crashed at my apartment <laughs> <laughs> years later. Um, in those days, the voice of peace was uh, very keen to, to be a commercial operation. And Tavas Advertising, remember Tavas, the big advertising agency, they more or less told us what to play. And what they wanted was a 24-hour-a-day music machine. And that's what we were. Uh, we brought a crew of Australian broadcasters in from Ford uh, G in Gold Coast, Queensland. We uh, stole their format. We, we became four double G Aus Australia off the uh, um, Israeli coast. Bill and myself didn't agree with that. That was a different thing entirely because we thought they should have been different. But having said that, the station ran 24 hours a day like a, a kind of souped up Radio London. Advertising was all over the place. It was 24 hours a day. And the revenue was used to pay the disc jockeys a good living wage. They stayed at the Sheraton Hotel, but more importantly, AB used those funds to finance hospitals. He supported uh, a hospital wing at Tel Hashemir Hospital for children from the Arab world to have medical treatments from Gaza. Um, he was never, he, this was never mentioned at the time. Everyone kept saying, oh, the voice of peace is just a money-making machine. Well, it was at that time. Uh, but the money was used for all sorts of good uh, organisations and benefits. And um, it was plain, we, we were doing very well. Suddenly, though, Keith Ashton got himself in trouble. He was our programme director. I won't go into details as to what he did, but he had to leave the station, which coincided with the start of uh, an Israeli organisation called Reshet Gimel. For some reason, A.B. Nathan decided to open the way for them to become the number one music station and we changed our format to MOR. We were suddenly playing wall to wall Perry Como. The advertising dropped off, didn't it? Tavas were freaking out. Um, Russia Gilmer came on the air with no competition and they became the number one station, numero uno. I refused to adopt AB Nathan's new format. I carried on using the double G format. So the breakfast show still had advertising, thanks be to God, which enabled us to buy fuel and, and, and water. But uh, yes, we were a different station. And it was the start of May 1976. That was when the money began to dry up and then all the vicissitudes that you guys put up with commenced. We were just uh, we're going to talk to Bill in a moment. We were just uh, talking, weren't we, Keith, that, uh, as Don was saying, it was mostly pop during the day, then suddenly it's six o'clock in the evening, do you remember twilight time? Indeed, yeah. Which was, oh, well, it was, it was Perry Como, all of that sort of stuff. I actually got away one day, we were playing Kate Bush, didn't I? <laughs> we, wait, we were waiting for the Motorola to go. That, that would be a 90-minute programme, and then we'd have classical music, wouldn't we, until nine? Yeah, that's right. And yeah. then the heaviest rock show from Absolutely. nine o'clock. Classical. Well, it was oh. specialist programmes after that. Yeah, it was all specialist yeah. programmes, so like Peace yeah. Hour. Yeah, and then we, we used to do this this other programme on a Sunday night, didn't we? Um, it was like a world tour. Oh, yeah, the music from around thing, the world, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So international showcase. International showcase, yeah. Yeah, international showcase where we'd play music from around the world, anywhere but like the given countries. But one, one day I filled in for it. I think you did this as well. And we pretended we were on a plane and we had to do an emergency landing in Canada and play Gordon Lightfoot. <laughs> sure, that's right, yeah. Those are the... Uh, the Israeli TV people were asking me earlier, what programme did you do? I said, well, like anyone else on the ship, every programme. Because everyone everything. did every programme. I mean, you, you had to, because people coming and going. And mm. you, you now, Bill, you used to do a lot of the engineering? 
Yes. That, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the uh, the ship itself and the transmitters and everything? In the beginning, in uh, from 1973 till uh, 77, um, I worked with um, audio equipment, with uh, transmitters, and I did also uh, sometimes uh, the engines uh, and the upper deck generators, and it was quite good. It's good equipment. It's, um, the engines for the transmitters uh, up, the, up, the, up the upper deck were quite new, the Rolls Royce, very new. All the equipment uh, for audio also was also new. Only the um, transmitters were old, were Collins uh, rebuilt for modulation. In the first uh, place were uh, CW uh, for the army, it came from the army. And Jesuit priest he, uh, b built it inside the, the ship in 17... 72, I believe that it was. When it was in New York, I was for half a year in New York, and we bought a lot of uh, good and new equipment. It was uh, very... Uh what was it actually like in New York when you were fitting out the ship? How easy was it to fit out the ship? You had no problems? No, not at all. No. The only, yeah, later on, we lost also our anchor, twice. <laughs> <laughs> and we had a, 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 we call it a stock anchor, a stock uh, anchor. Um, it was a little bit drifting, but it, uh, it keep going. And I went to Holland to buy an anchor chain and an anchor. Because the ship almost sank in the Bermuda Triangle, didn't it? Um, no, that's not... Uh, not uh, <laughs> well, I remember no, this concrete a little casing. Bit I remember this concrete casing up front. Yeah, uh, we had an... Uh, because it was in a long time to stay in New York, uh, uh, in, uh, yeah, yeah. about the level of, of the water. And it was a small hole. Say that. Small hole, but a small it, it hole for about a meter. <laughs> <laughs> in the middle in of length, the ocean. In length. In the middle of the ocean. And then we came in in, in, uh, in the storm. We had a lot of trouble, uh, by the way. There was a Portuguese guy. We thought that he was a spy for, uh, in that time, uh, the government. <coughs> we thought that was. And Roger was in sailor. He uh, was running after him with an axe. <laughs> <laughs> And then all of a sudden, um, I came down below and I saw water. And we had, before we left uh, New York, we uh, took uh, cement in, uh, a couple of bags of cement. Uh, Pete, uh, you remember Pete? Yeah, Pete was, Coyote uh, Pete. Uh, Pete Coyote Pete, Pete Vales. Pete Vales, yeah. Pete Vales uh, uh, that's a good idea. We, uh, for, um, if we have a leak, yeah, we don't have a leak. We don't. Like on the Mimigo. But we had a leak. <laughs> and then the water runs in the oil tanks. And the oil tanks came fuller and came above the hedges, and then it runs in the water tank. So we had um, diesel in the water and water in the diesel. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that casing because it got it always yeah. got painted we, over. We, but you saw the concrete, and with a little fat Filipino finger, it said, it is, yes, "Save yes, us, that dear God." God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That was his mark. That was a joke, by the way. Oh, oh, I never knew that. And then we stayed for 14 days in, the, in Bermuda, and then we went to uh, Marseille, and also with a lot of trouble. We had a drunken Norwegian captain, a drunken uh, Norwegian engineer, two of them, the three drunken Norwegians. And in Marseille, they went all off. And there we were, with, uh, with no uh, crew at all. And then came Francois Bonson, was a French captain, with his wife. Uh, they came aboard for nine months. They stayed for nine months with us. He was a very good captain, very, very good captain. But he um, left also. Very nice man. Yeah, he's a very nice man. Um, I'd like to go back to talking about programs again. Uh, to you particularly, Don, when I worked with you in 85 and Keith York, mm. you said we were on the air for 24 hours a day. We, mm. in fact, went on to work for 26 hours a day by splitting the media wave and the FM. Yes, we did. And on the least popular of the two channels, which I think was the AM. It was the AM, We yes. put on two wonderful programs, which AB insisted we presented every night. That's right. The Russian Hour. That's correct. Well, and there was a, a Portuguese Hour. We had yeah, to play... Had AB had friends... At the time, well, AB had friends at the Portuguese <laughs> Embassy, apparently, Portuguese oh, Israelis. Yeah. And we had to fill up an hour of Portuguese music, which wasn't easy, because to start with, none of us spoke a word of Portuguese. That's true. And we only had seven records. Yeah. Um, <laughs> good, good. 
Have you? There was another hour as well. Well, we, 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 hour, we, we played Spanish music, of course, because they, we didn't know the difference between Portuguese and Spanish. So <laughs> we had a huge library of Spanish tracks, and so we played lots of Julio Iglesias and everything else uh, that was uh, found, including South American artists yeah. as well. The funny thing was, though, that uh, the reason that Yorkie and yourself and myself decided to separate the, 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 the frequencies, which was the first time it was done, the voice of peace, was that the, the Russian hour was an absolute tune-out factor. We lost, lost all our audience, yeah. and AB asked us to go to the country again in '85 to revamp the voice of peace. And the way forward was to provide, again, that chain-belt 24-hour music service that we'd had in 76 and 75. Mm. So Yorkie and yourself uh, got the AM separated, all the Russian and Gypsy and Latin American went there, keep the Russians happy in Syria. That was the whole idea. That was our effort for peace. On the AM, FM 100 stereo, we had hot hits 24 hours a day, Rock in the Bay. And it was superb. And you know it paid off too. It paid off very well, but shortly after it was all over. Well, Abi, of course, panicked, didn't he? Yeah. Came back from Ethiopia, and someone, I think, in the government got to him and said, "Look, your listener figures are going up again. You're, you're destabilising the, the listenership patterns in Israel." And again, I can't understand why he gave in so easily after dragging Yorkie and myself all that way from from Ireland. We had our own radio station we were launching. Mm -hmm. we, he said, you have carte blanche. You need to build up revenue. We need the advertising revenue to do the uh, best we can for the Ethiopians who would suffer from an earthquake. Yeah. Yeah. Yorkie and myself delivered on the package. The advertising rolled in. And within four weeks, AB's panicking. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wind it down, lads. Back off, back off. Yeah, I why? could never understand why he did that. I never understood that. Either. No. And next thing was, he went into Ashdod. And you remember that? I left a few days before. I left a few days before that. I spent a month there at my own expenses because AP had told me they had a big problem with the transmitter. Okay, I went there. You, well, the, Keith York to solve the problem anyway. The time. Yeah, but you guys worked together and you got that split service working, which was superb. Yeah, well, it all, it all going, After after you'd gone, myself and Noam literally dismantled and rebuilt every transmitter on the ship. Uh, we got both the AMs working at once. For the first time in full power for 10 years, I think, or full power exactly. through the combiner. Uh, the we FM, I remember we took the entire thing to bits, cleaned every bit of it because it was waterlogged, and um, put it all back together again. But the problem was, when we turned the whole lot on, the generator couldn't stand the load. Yes. <laughs> and so there was what this particular record was at the time, and this is a funny thing. It was called Walking on Sunshine by Katrina and, and the, the Waves. waves. <laughs> and uh, and on the high bit of it, the walking on sunshine bit, the generator used to slow. <laughs> and it goes, you can hear the generator <laughs> slow down. And then, of course, the turntable slowed down as well because they were synchronously linked to the generator for the speed. So it goes, walking on sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so I remember Noel Aviram got on the motor all to Avery, and he says, we need a bigger generator immediately, Avery, otherwise I will not take responsibility of the equipment could be damaged. <laughs> it's put in the port and got a new Rolls-Royce on. Oh, that's when the Rolls-Royce came on. Yeah, that's right, yeah. The new, well, the Rolls-Royce was... They put this Perkins thing on, which didn't work. Oh. Wouldn't run the, run, wouldn't run the entire radio the station. Chalmers also. Oh, the Alice wasn't working the anyway. Was time. Mm -hmm. So we, we eventually went to support in Ashdod, and we got in the, a new roller on. It always annoyed me that the generators on the ship were in the most unpleasant place. I've always, I've always thought that the person who designed the ship had never, or designed the ship to be a radio ship, but the never spent a day on his life any, anyway. There was but one generator beside the mess, another one on the roof of the mess. Yeah. I think that would be Bill over there yeah. on your right hand side, Bob. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, but he didn't put them on. <laughs> what did I do? He had to work with the Alice Chalmers, which yeah. was never easy. Because after the, after the Rolls Royce came on, maybe got us to turn one of the AMs off anyway because it was yeah. using too much diesel. <laughs> it was getting out though, wasn't it? I mean, the, the signal was hitting oh, Greece, out, yeah. Cyprus. TX1 was brilliant. We really back. did a good job on that. I heard later a story that um, the engine separated itself from the generator. <laughs> I don't know if it is true. That was after me, after I left. I, I overhauled it and then I All think the time, I made yeah. a mistake. <laughs> um, but after the, I appeared there in 70, 85, uh, did you ever hear from AB again? No, we, we, well, the thing was that AB uh, called us out to, to help him 
during this particular time, he was determined to get the revenue increased, the advertising revenue pushed up, and the audience figures. Um, once the whole package fell apart for no reason, I can't understand why, but we went back to Galway and got our station up and running, the same kind of 4 G format, and uh, we never heard from AB after that. It, it, it was. I think he just felt terrible because after that, the, the story of the voice of peace seems to be one of a slow decline. Mm. There was clearly pressure on A.B. Nathan from somewhere in government or from some people within Israel to uh, keep his station uh, down and mm. under control. He was never allowed a license. He should have been given one. Mm. He would have been a responsible broadcaster. He never used his radio station, even when he was uh, out of the control of any government, to abuse governments. He was, uh, though he's a hard man to work for, he was always a very fair and honest man. And any revenues he made, despite what you may hear, were used always for, for good causes. Mm -hmm. He never benefited at all. So I can't understand why he scuttled the ship, for example. None of us can understand that. There was no reason to do it. The ship should have been preserved by the people of Israel as a monument to one man's determination to have people talk to each other. For some reason, people in Israel did not get behind the, the, the station. I don't know why, but again, there's always this thought that there are people in the Israeli government who did not want AB to succeed. Yet all the other pirates mm. all got licenses. Mm. Mm. Well, there's always nag me because uh, I think looking back, and this is very clear, in fact, if you read the, the book, mm. which, well, all right, I blow this one, I've had it for a couple of weeks. Um, <laughs> It, it becomes clear that, that, in fact, was a was a turning point. That was an important turning point in the history of the piece because after that, it just mm. petered out. Mm. Well, Amy knew that. That's why he probably called York and myself in because he wanted two crazy guys who didn't mind uh, throwing everything into the mi mix. No. We, we brought a jingle package from, uh, was it TM Productions gave us that package, That's Air right, Checks? Yeah. Yeah, it was. It was team production. Yeah, and right. And we chopped it all up and, and got the original New York singers onto that. We mixed it all in. You guys worked 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to not just get the transmitters up to power. Uh, you you got the FMs working superbly. You got the AM pumping out full power for the first time in, in what have you many years. You also um, got the production studio uh, to be working as a second studio for the AM, the Russian programs. Yeah. And then once you told me, okay, Don, we, we've done it. I mean, you guys worked like Trojans, and we were all waiting with the productions. And you said, okay, we're on full power at 6 a.m. And we came on, bang, and we blew the Middle East apart. Now that's when the station was really—it was—it was humming, it was—it yeah, was percolating, and it was scaring people. And this is why, after that, once we, we disappeared, we went to Ashdod. I was so angry, and I don't know about Yorkie. We just got on a plane, went back to Britain, and then mm. on to Ireland. Mm. Mm. Uh, Did, uh, we never heard from AB again. We were all very disappointed at that time. I remember when I left, I said AB was in Ethiopia at that time. We didn't he was, see yes. Him. Uh, never Counting upon everybody in the, in the office said it's great. AB's yes. away. We're having fun. The station yeah. sounded great. But when AB he came the, back, it was the money that we were making that kept him over there. He yes. was buying the tents. He was buying food for the Ethiopians, and we were doing exactly as he asked us. He said, "Make the station produce money. Yes. We need the money for the Ethiopians." And suddenly, he turns up from Ethiopia. Pulls out the, and pulls oh, the whole yeah, thing apart. Yeah, yeah the station what was doing at that happened? time what it was supposed to do. I remember we saying to, to, to Ruben at the office, "I'm going back to Amsterdam now." Call me if you want. I can come back for another six months or a year. I don't mind. Ruben. I've got money in my pocket. Just give me a call. I'll come. Poor Ruben. Never got called again. Uh. Neither did you. Well, he was calling me on the Motorola saying, for God's sake, will you tone it down? People are getting <laughs> angry here. And I said, well, Gannett Sahal and Rashid Gimel are upset. Deal. We're going to keep pumping this mother. And we did. But in the end, we got... We got screwed. <laughs> oh, okay, now, who else is here who was on the Voice of Peace? Is Robbie Owen still? Yeah, he's, would you like Hello, to come Robbie. and sit a bit closer so you can chip in? We've got a radio mic here. Make a comment on that do, you, do you want to come and sit down the front here somewhere or with us or wherever you can? <laughs> and it might be worth as well. We've got uh, John, John so, Dwyer. Yeah, John, and also a couple from uh, Israel themselves. Yes, for Israel the, themselves. We've got Gabby, those. Gabby, Gabby Baton. Uh, Gabby Baton, is he here? Is he here? He is. He is here somewhere. Oh. That's that's a drag. Ah, yeah. got to catch a plane. Who else have we got here? Um, Noam? Noam Tal, is he Noam here? Noam Tal? Oh, Noam, do you want to come over? Oh, he's filming. Yeah, do you get somebody else to film. Who else from Israel is here? You got anybody else from Israel? We have Channel 2 here. Channel. Do you want to come out? Gil, do you want to, do you want to come up? John, we've got Channel 2. Yeah. 
Doesn't matter, you've got a camera, that, that'll do. Uh, no, radio no. George. That was a good station. I wonder, I know that we've got somebody who was on his way from uh, College Rail as well. I wonder if Greg, Greg's here? I know he was in Frankfurt when he gave me a call earlier on, but uh, he was hoping to be here before we finished, but he was coming over. But uh, he used to work on College Rail, so... Well, Greg, Greg Shafritz? Yeah. yeah, Greg? He's not arrived yet? Not arrived. Hopefully he will be before we finish, because uh, as I say, earlier on today, he did give me a call from Frankfurt, and he was on his way, so... Really? Here we jo go. Yeah. Johnny, can I make a, a comment? You carry I, on. I, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to chip in, because this debate that's just been going on in the last few minutes, t to be honest... It's the same one that I've been hearing for nearly 30 years. Um, and I think that there's some fundamentals that you need to recognize. The Voice of Peace was first and foremost A.B. Nathan's radio station. And when he first put it on the air, it was to be financed from donations. It included lots of talk programs. And the whole style of the station was totally different to anything that came later what they discovered was they couldn't pay the bills. And so people like Ken Dickin and Keith Ashton were brought in. And for a while, AB let them do what they did best. They were radio professionals, hardened commercial radio professionals. And they brought, for a short time, they brought the station huge success. Now, having spent quite a lot of time with AB, I can tell you, he never liked the radio station. We know that. that. He, he, so it may have been a great... But he wanted the money, okay? So he, he may wanted, have he wanted, wanted the, the money. He sold out for the money, and that's why Keith Ashton had him over a barrel. Once Keith Ashton was removed from the station, this is when the station declined. And you, well, I'm agreeing with you yeah, totally, Don, but you have to be okay. aware that the money that AB got from Tavas Advertising was very useful for the Peace Project. Don, understand that. that. Yeah, I understand that. And and I you weren't that. even there at the, the time, no, whereas I was. That's true, and the money that that, that that brought in, AB made great play of using it. He did, yes. But, and this, is, and this is a recurring theme that happened through the life of the station, if individual presenters or individual program directors, senior presenters, call, call, call them whatever, if they became too influential, if they started to become famous in their own right, and this is something that directly affected you, Don, was they threatened Abe's position as the head of the, st of the station. And Absolute as, as, rubbish. As Absolute the rubbish. Yes, Abe Nathan came back to me year after year after year to work with him. I appeared with him at the Sholem uh, uh, uh demonstrations in 1978, and I can assure you that A.B. Nathan was not threatened by me. I was merely a broadcaster doing his bidding, and I was a servant of the company, and I was happy to be so. Now, it's true to say that Keith Ashton did exercise extreme control over the station, which benefited A.B. Nathan humongously as regards finance. But I personally was never a threat to A.B. Nathan. If, if, I, if I was, why would he ask me to come back whilst I'm launching my own business in 1985? I had a huge investment in Ireland, two stations, two transmitters, and 35 Don, staff. So you've and said. I still came back to help him because I made him a promise. Okay, and now, that, on, that is... The point I'm making is... I was never, you, you said I was a threat to the station or I was affected by it. I was never affected by it. The station and I were just, we, we existed and we, we coexisted. It was only after that, that once AB had learnt the danger of Keith Ashton, and once I left the station in November 76, that AB thought he will never allow anybody else to become a, a, a challenge. His problem was that late on, the Israeli magazine did a listener poll during December of 1976, while I was in Britain, and I was voted the only foreign broadcaster in the top ten. Never happened before or since. That's when AB really worried, but he brought me back to the ship again. Okay. The comment I'm making is it, it's a recurring theme that, that if the station achieved too much autonomy from what AB saw as his goals and the way he wanted the radio station to sound, <clears throat> is he moved the people around, or he, he forced them forced them out, or he, 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 he foisted yeah, he different programs on them. And, and, you know, yes, it's quite right I wasn't there in that, in that heyday period, but I arrived very shortly after that, and, I, and you're saying many of the same things now that you did then, which was, oh, it's nowhere near as good now as it was then. You were saying that in 1978. Mm, it depends I was. how that you... Was based upon, yeah, but that Don, was based upon commercial revenue, yeah, Sunshine. Okay, okay. And that's commercial the, revenue, I'm sorry to tell you, Don, is what makes a radio station yeah. function. 
if you're making the money, you're successful. Now, where do you come from? You're too politically correct. No, Get I, a life, dude. Get a life. Don, I up. am not... We had to raise money for... Am I being projects. shouted down, ladies and gentlemen? Can I have my say? Okay. Having run a commercial radio station and owned yes. a quarter of that radio station, I've I, owned know, a radio I station. know very well about commercial pressures. So I'm talking specifically, the Voice of Peace was never primarily a commercial operation. It had periods when it was an aggressive... It had periods when it was, was an aggressive commercial operation, but actually they're relatively short periods in its life. Most of the time, it was run exactly as AB wanted it, and as a result, many of the DJs were unhappy with things they had to do or the conditions on the ship. But in many ways, those philosophies and ideals that he, he put onto the radio station, his expectations, were very much more in common with what you associate, most people here would associate with Caroline than Radio London. And that was the point I wanted to make, Don, because you painted a picture that basically for two years it was hugely commercially successful. Yes, it was, but it was actually on the air for nearly 20 years. So let's be careful to take a balanced view. The, the, the Voice of Peace across its time did some really sensational programs, did some really dreadful programs, but it was innovative. It also tried to put across a message uh, a very important message and one that is extremely the idea of loving your neighbours and, 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 and helping people who are in distress is not exactly compatible with the aims of a, of, a, of, a, of a purely commercial radio station and I think it's important that the voice of peace is put in that context and everyone who's been on for a certain period of that station I notice they all say that was the best period so you were there in the heyday well, in 76. Okay. That, that the, is truth is, the truth thing. is, my friend, uh, one thing I'd like to say. We, we dealt with AB and Ethel on a one-to-one -one basis in 75 and 76. I know that you guys dealt with him by Motorola. I can assure you that AB and Ethel was very pleased to receive those checks from Tavas, and he was very happy to go to Tel Hashemir Hospital and finance those wards for those children. You're, you're adopting a, a, a backward view I'm talking about the time at the time. It's very nice to look back in perspective and say how things were or should have been. I can assure you that at the time, A.B. Nathan was very happy to take the money and invest it in good projects. I, and I, he did. Can I, and I, the I station was successful. Yeah. Yeah. The can fact I, that... Sorry, Don. Right, carry on. Sorry, Don. I didn't mean to interrupt. But no, no. Uh, Noam just wants to say a few words on this subject as well. Is that okay? Do you want to use this one? Oh, okay, well, is it okay? This one is okay. Okay? Okay, thank you. For the last four years, I'm uh, visiting AB around once a week or so, and I had the opportunity to speak with him about the Voice of Peace and the way he regards the ship and the Voice of Peace radio station. Of course, he was very, uh, he really loved the Voice of Peace radio station, but he considered the Voice of Peace, as I understand it, as part of what he's doing. Most of the money that he raised, I'm, I, I know that 76 and 79 from documentation was very, very uh, good year for the Voice of Peace. He made lots of money, and most of this money went, as Don said, to hospitals. But later on, AB raised most of his money in the States from a Jewish organization like Bnei Brit and also uh, all over the world. The idea for him, uh, having the Voice of Peace as being very popular and letting uh, uh, everyone uh, know him. Uh, in, in the AB behaves, uh, is very stubborn. I mean, he's, he's not willing to uh, accept any idea except of his own. If you want to cause AB to do something, you need to uh, act as if uh, the idea is uh, from the beginning AB's idea. Otherwise, he won't accept it. And even now, there's where he's quite sick, he's still, it's still the same. It's very hard to convince him. Uh, for instance, I'll tell you a story. I, to I was told by someone, he went to Egypt and uh, someone in Egypt asked him, why are you not uh, playing Arab music? So he bought around 100 or 200 uh, Arabic cassettes that only people from uh, Cairo area would appreciate it and told the DJs to play it for a period of time. And of course it was good for the, for the, the ship. But as I understand it, he needed the opportunity to have the microphone to be able to speak, to be able to say whatever he wants. And as long as the ship was not losing too much money, he thought about keeping it. 
That's all. It's brilliant. That's right. Do you think it's right? Do you, think it's right? Do you accept? When we started uh, from New York, we had four. Uh, uh, what we can call desk, it was a French desk, a uh, German desk, was very important okay. for him, an English desk and a Hebrew desk. Uh, the purpose was to get all the people together on board and to start a discussion. It never, never came to that. Happened. Never happened. The only thing was uh, always shortage of money from the beginning. And later on, I worked one and a half year for nothing, right. only for some pocket money. After one and a half years, he got his advertisement, and he made a lot of money. And then I said, okay, I will stay, but you have to pay me. And I got $250 a month. I didn't know how much the station uh, got, uh, what they earned. They didn't know that. The Dishyokis did the same. He never paid them well. That was the During 1976, the, from, the from ship made around $1, one million dollar in eight months. I know and it from documents. If I knew that, then... then <laughs> <laughs> he lost some more money. <laughs> But it should be said also that Bill Dance here is one of the unsung heroes of the Voice of Peace because I'm always annoyed that you never get mentioned in the books and, and I know the work you did for the ship. Without Bill here, there would never have been a Voice of Peace. He commissioned the transmitters in New York. He stayed with the ship from New York. He worked. I met him on Caroline. He got me interested in, in the Voice of Peace project. Um, he believed in the project. When I was out on the ship in 75, in 76, and certainly from 75, uh, Bill was the person who kept the damn thing running, even when AB couldn't or wouldn't get sp spare parts. And it should be acknowledged for all of you, this is the man, mm. apart from AB Nathan, who kept the station going. Yeah. Without him, there would never have been a voice of peace. Yeah. Bill, and it Bill should Bill be acknowledged here and now. Yeah, you were. You were there uh, from the very beginning. His troubles with his yeah. strikes, uh, yeah. you, you name it, his, uh, and you were always there. A lot of uh, hard times we had. But it was, uh, and you gave us that wonderful signal that gave us a huge audience in 75 yeah, and 76. Tony Allen, eh? Tony Allen. Oh, Tony Allen. Yeah, Tony yeah. Allen, yeah. 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 We should mention Tony because uh, Tony was the very first. Tony, Tony was the guy. Yeah, he was the guy. And, and Tony, people Tony often Bird. forget about Tony. And yet he was the man that introduced the VOP to yeah, the audience. Yeah. He Who's broadcast. The yeah, he kept broadcasting during and the Yom Kippur War. Yeah. He carried on on the ship. Yeah. The ship was almost sunk. And, um, we but went also to shoot, eh? Yeah, but Tony and yourself are the real heroes, mate. But it is not one time that he went to Lebanon. It was the second time then. Eh? The first time he went uh, with a lot of uh, flowers we collected. The boats came and we thought, flowers, flowers, flowers. And then we went to Beirut. And I saw the same as, uh, as usual in, uh, in uh, Lebanon, uh, the, the gunfires. But we never get there. And uh, after a week, we have to drop all the flowers, and then we went through uh, uh, the Suez Canal. We never uh, we stayed. Yeah, uh, we, we, we went through the canal. We, eh, we shall days. surely be taking a break, but before that, uh, I'd like to ask Cass if you wanted to say something about uh, the Suez, Suez adventure. Well, the, the trip through the Suez Canal was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> it, I had a guard with a gun behind me. Right, you have to go through in yeah. convoys, and there were all these merchant ships, one behind another, going through. And way at the end, there was a, 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 an Egyptian gunboat, yep. then us, and then another Navy escort. But Abi was not there. Huh? We were sandwiched. No, no, no Abi was not And the board. Navy was on board as well. I remember coming on deck as we were in the Bitter Lakes, and one of these gunboats was sailing alongside. And there was this gun tor turret on, this, on their deck, and the barrel just followed me as I walked to the bow. <laughs> And as I made my way back very quickly, it turned even faster and just followed that was me. For you. That was for you. I stayed inside. And they, confis well, they confiscated all the equipment. They sealed the studios. Yes. They wanted all the radios, but I didn't surrender mine. This is what I wanted to tell you. Then, uh, A.B., uh, he was on board. I remember now. He was on board. He was with us. A.B. wanted to know what the, the publicity fallout would be from... Finally, yeah, managing he had to go through. Passport. He, was, he went with his British passport. He, he was with us. Yeah. And um, yeah. we had to surrender all the radios, all the equipment. We couldn't listen. We couldn't transmit. We couldn't <coughs> do anything. They were panicking about us. Yeah. They, they freaked out. Yeah. But they let us through. And, and AB asked me, uh, we were talking over dinner, and I said, I still have my radio. And he asked me, can we listen to the news? And I said, yeah, I'll meet you at 7 on the bow. So it was dark. We were sailing through the Suez Canal. Starry sky, UN tents on the sides every once in a while, 
and this huge aerial sailing in the Middle East through the desert. It was wonderful. I'll never forget that sight. And I meet A.B. on the bow with this uh, transistor radio in my pocket, and we tune it to Call Israel, the news yeah. in English, yeah. Alexander Diamond. Oh, yeah. yeah. And we were the final story. And there were comments from the Arab world, from, from Egypt, and the story ended with Alexander saying that all uh, an Israeli government official would comment was, A.B. Nathan is a pain in the neck. And that's the news <laughs> from Jerusalem. <laughs> so A.B. looks at me with these big brown eyes and said, what did you say? <laughs> I said, you're a pain in the neck, A.B. That was wonderful. But we made it through. We went to Eilat. It was a great trip. All right. Let's take a break now. Back in 10 minutes for the 80s. Okay. Oh, thank you. Hans. Oh, oh. Yep. Hey, Bill. We've well, got Martin here who wants to say a few words. Eh? Thank you. It's important for so you to talk to Because you and I have good times together. When we invited all you guys, we always wanted to have a discussion about the Voice of Peace, and we got this discussion. And despite having some arguments, I think this discussion is a good one. And we want to have peace once again now. <laughs> and would like to have a break of 10 minutes and then talking about the 80s and the 90s. Ni Nigel Harris is the only one uh, having been on board in the 90s, I think. And before the break, we have the official presentation of Hans Knott's new book. But first, but first I would like to read uh, two emails, and Martin one, which came in also uh, this week. Greetings from Big Mango, Bangkok. A few words for me to say that I was in 1976 when, at 20, I first ventured into offshore radio, the voice of peace for just three months and the start of an adventure of a lifetime. A few names that come to mind, Mark Harrell, Stevie Gordon, Don Stevens, Kevin McCoy, and of course, Howard Rose. A Filipino helper whose name I forget, and an engineer who I believe deserted the French Foreign Legion I could never understand his existence because he always slept next to an extremely loud generator, Hans suffered from severe sleep deprivation and appeared a total nervous wreck. He was therefore pretty useless but a real character. Please pass on my best to everyone at the Voice of Peace get together and it was signed Richard Buckle aka Richard Jackson. Ah, yes. Yes. Still around. Then we got an email from Graham Cook, who, is, who was Peter Phillips on Caroline 558, you remember all very well. And Graham wrote, many thanks for the pictures you sent me, they brought back some memories. I remember a German film crew coming out to the peace ship and shooting a documentary, but I've never seen it before or any part of it. I can't be able to attend the Voice of Peace reunion. I have a number of commitments on that day and really can't spare the time. Another year, perhaps, it sounds like fun. Do pass on my apologies and best, best wishes to those who remember me. Oh, I have another one from New York, which came in. Oh. He, uh, the sky was uh, looking at the internet pages where already a few chapters of the book uh, were there. Many thanks for the galley shot of my contribution to the book. It sure brought back memories to see what had I had produced at the time. The goals of A.B. Nathan were incredible, and so many of the mechanics of A.B.'s ideas really did come to pass. Even though the formidable idea of peace has not come to the Middle East, A.B. was one of the few who caught admiration from both sides of the equation. Thanks for keeping me posted. Russell Dodworth, A.B.'s right hand in New York. I, uh, I'm not able to give all people who have worked for the Voice of Peace a book, for it's a very thick one, so it would be very expensive, and I had to ha eat dry bread for a few months. <laughs> so <laughs> I have to make uh, a decision to choose a few people. Uh, first of all, Bob Knox, who I know already for many, many years, real good friend, and thank you for the work. Hans, thank you. Okay. I, I, Sorry. I'm not sure if I deserve this, but I'm very honoured to accept it. Thank you, Hans. Okay. 
And uh, morning, lad. <laughs> <laughs> the only for you to enjoy it. Then I would like to talk uh, to Robbie Owen. Robbie, I have also a copy for you, with thank thanks you. for the slideshow. You're welcome. Will you sign it for me? Yes, of course. Yes, okay, we'll do it later. And please, I would like to uh, speak to Noam. Noam does very good work. Uh, is, uh, has not only worked for the Voice of Peace, but he spends a lot of free time uh, in his life now to spend hours with Abi. I would love to give you three copies from the book, one for yourself, for your work you have done to get all these photos free from the Israeli and Argives and the family Nathan. In the book is also a CD enclosed with a few hundred of photographs which have never been published before, thanks to him. Uh, this one is for you. Thank Enjoy you very it. much, Hans. Thank you very much. Okay. And maybe you can give this copy to Amy himself. I will. And Sharona, the daughter of Amy Natum, has written the foreword together with Noam for the book. He, she is living in Florida, but I'm sure you will meet her again and you can give her a copy like, I would like to say a few words on behalf of uh, Amy Nathan. As uh, you know very well, Amy Nathan is not uh, well nowadays. He's reaching 80s and his situation is uh, deteriorating from day to day. He, has, he still has the times that he can speak with us and tell us stories or things that happened on the on what he did for many many years all over the world but these uh, days that we can speak with him becoming uh, more and more uh, narrow or so and i really uh, want to thank you all on behalf of ab nathan and his family for what you did those who you were on the uh, peace ship the Voice of Peace family, and all the people all over the world that were interested in what he did and were helping him. And of course, thank you very much, Hans Knot, for what you did, because now that the book is written and so, so many people all over the world will be able to read for, for the first time in English about what hey, A.B. did, and maybe his uh, ideas and his goals will go on, and maybe more and more people all over the world will be able to uh, take, uh, I don't know how to say it in English, but to lead these ideas and go on with it for the benefit of all of us. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, and no one brought with him uh, CDs with uh, v o P Voice of Peace MP3 files. It's so that uh, the ownership was uh, a recorder who went on as soon as the uh, microphone switch was switched on. So for four days, the tape was running. You were hearing all uh, the spoken words and the commercials, etc., which is are on this CDs. And all the people who are here, who have worked for the Voice of Peace, can take their own copy.